It is the fall of 1864. General Sherman had left Atlanta to create uh, what becomes known as the March to the Sea. The Confederate General John Bell Hood has his sights set on Tennessee with the hopes of defeating the Union Army and then unrealistically joining perhaps Robert E. Lee in Virginia. Uh, John Bell Hood was a Confederate general. Uh, he was wounded at Gettysburg in 1863 uh, and he had uh, lost use of his arm. He has his sights, as we said, uh, on Nashville, which is located in the north central part of the state of Tennessee. Uh, he has about 37, 39,000 men at his disposal. So before this attack begins, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, the wizard of the saddle and the perpetrator of the Fort Pillow Massacre, uh, is riding around the Union Army, uh, wrecking the rail lines, uh, making havoc, and tying down large numbers of Union troops. Um, facing off against John Bell Hood is the Union General John Schofield, who is commander of the 23rd Corps, which is known as the Army of the Ohio. Um, Schofield was also a graduate of West Point. In fact, John Bell Hood and John Schofield graduated from West Point in the same class. Most of my information comes from the uh, official records of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, we're going to hear from Orlando Moore. Uh, he was the commander of the 2nd Brigade of the 2nd Division. And then we're also going to hear from Leander S. McGraw, who was the acting commander of the 107th Illinois. So Schofield here uh, has his army basically gathered um, around what we call Johnsonville, Tennessee. Johnsonville was a rail hub, and this picture was taken in November of 1864, and you can get a sense of just how wet and nasty and cold it probably was there. Uh, this Union encampment seen here in an army topography map with the cleared timber. Uh, well, we know this photograph is of Johnsonville because there is the cleared timber off in the distance. Um, well, according to Moore, as well as McGraw, uh, the 107th Illinois uh, would leave Johnsonville, Tennessee, and head to Nashville, uh, and then down to Columbia, about 40 miles south of that city. Uh, there at Columbia, um, the Union Army is gathering. Now, Columbia is a lot like Monticello. It's a county seat, so you've got the courthouse. Um, it's a much larger community uh, than what we have here. Um, but using, of course, the records that I have and the topography maps, uh, we learned that the Union Army, or at least the 107th, arrived in Columbia at 2.30 a.m. on the 24th of November. The troops immediately disembarked and massed on a hill near the fort. Um, so somewhere along this rail line here, the 107th would have got to Columbia about 2.30 that morning, and then they would have headed off into their position. Um, this is the Little Bigby Creek, uh, which is a small stream that flows into the nearby Duck River. Uh, the 107th Illinois would skirmish with Confederate forces there along the Little Bigby Creek. And uh, using, as I've, as I've said, topography maps as well as you know, modern-day Google Earth, uh, I was able to locate that and get some video. Now... On November 28th and 29th, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate Cavalry Commander, is going to probe around the Union lines, and he's going to find a weakness. And what's going to end up happening is that John Bell Hood is going to send his Army Corps across. The morning of November 29th, two of Hood's corps crossed the Duck River just east of Columbia. With one corps left to hold the Union Army, Hood planned to get between Schofield and Nashville. Wagner positions his troops around Spring Hill to protect the Union retreat route to the Columbia Pike. At 4 p.m., Claiborne's troops arrived and advanced toward the Columbia Pike to cut the Union retreat. Taking flanking fire from Bradley's hidden troops, Lowry and Govan try and push Bradley back to Spring Hill. Though poised to continue the assault, Cheatham orders Claiborne to halt while Brown moves into position. Just yards from cutting the Columbia Pike, the Confederates settle into camp for the night. Throughout the night, Schofield's troops silently pass within sight of the campfires of Hood's sleeping army. When the Confederates awoke the next morning, they soon discovered the Union Army had slipped away. So Spring Hill today is um, just a few miles north of Columbia. Uh, this is the battlefield where the battle at Spring Hill took place. Uh, it's all been purchased by the Battlefield Preservation Trust, so nobody's going to build any gas station, subdivision, shopping malls. Um, you'll see that a lot with Battlefield Preservation. A lot of the areas are turned into hiking trails and nature paths. And 
things like that. Spring Hill is just down there by the grain silo. And uh, down in Spring Hill, we have what's called the Columbia Turnpike. And so there, in the darkest hours of the night, uh, the 23rd Corps of the Union Army is gonna pass by the sleeping Confederates, uh, basically getting out in front of them and uh, making their way up to Franklin, Tennessee, which is where the major battle of this campaign is going to occur. So Franklin is just above Spring Hill. The 107th and 23rd Corps, uh, when we take a look at the map here, they marched 25 miles in about 22 hours, uh, which is quite the haul. Franklin, Tennessee is an interesting mixture between historical Tennessee and modern Tennessee. It's a growing community of about 86,000 people, and there's a great deal of wealth uh, and all sorts of fun things to do in the town not related to the Civil War. Uh, well, it was here, obviously, during the Civil War uh, that John Schofield, 23rd Corps, uh, is going to attempt to cross the Harpeth River on their way back to Nashville. Um, John Schofield is going to order his army to dig in on the southern end of town here. At the center of the Union line is what is known as Carter House. Uh, the Carters had built a plantation right out here on a rise just south of town, and that's going to be the headquarters for the Union Army uh, during the battle. Now, the 107th, along with the 23rd Corps, had over 12 hours. The Union had over 12 hours to dig in positions. This gentleman here is Patrick Claiborne. He is a Confederate commander. Uh, he was born and raised in Ireland, and he'd fought in the Confederate Army throughout the Civil War. Uh, he is going to be looking out uh, on this position here down to Franklin and he sees the Union trenches and he tells um, John Bell Hood that the uh, advance, the idea of launching a frontal assault is probably not the right idea. This photograph here is taken of Franklin in the 1950s and you'll notice there's a lot of farm ground all the way around there. Uh, now up here on Winstead Hill, uh, this is basically a Confederate shrine. Uh, this is where John Bell Hood uh, would have watched the Union position, and it's also where he would have ordered his army to attack the Union position around 4 p.m. on November 30th, 1864. So from this vantage point, Hood would have been able to see all the way over here to Franklin, uh, up there in the north. In this Google Earth view, uh, we are going south towards Winstead Hill, which is right here. And you can see there's been rock quarries and lumber yards and a, a lot of development there uh, on what was the former Franklin battlefield. Um, but the Confederates, well, uh, they're gonna step off, as we can see here in this 1864 photograph uh, from Winstead Hill uh, towards the Union position. There are going to be 30,000 men in John Bell Hood's army. It is the, one of the largest Confederate charges of the entire war. It is double the length of Pickett's charge. So their attack begins in the center of the Union line. In front of the main line, Wagner's men realized that their position would be quickly overcome. After firing a few volleys, they broke and ran. Seeing Wagner's brigades in flight, the rebel line surged forward with a yell, following the Yankees and using them to shield their advance. The Confederate assault fell on the weakest section of the Federal line, the point at which the road to Franklin intersected the Union fortifications. Cleburne's division surged through the gap and it looked for a moment as if the whole position would be carried. Claiborne from atop his horse leads the charge and during that incident he is going to be killed. Uh, his men will press on past the Carter House. Uh, now, the Carter House is the center of the battlefield, and it's been preserved. Um, as you make your way around the grounds, uh, it's a pretty good look at what a small plantation, a small farm, uh, would have looked like in Tennessee in 1864. So the back of the house there, and then as the camera will pan to the right, uh, we'll see the constructed, reconstructed slave cabins, although uh, some of them are original buildings with actual bullet holes in the wall. So there's a fierce amount of fighting that takes place here near the center. Burst through the center to the middle of the house area. Brutal and vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A few of uh, thousands of examples. A Confederate soldier bayoneted to death on the front steps. Yank immediately killed. A Yank bayoneted close to the front steps into the ground through the body. And before the southerner could pull the bayonet out of the ground and wound, 
his head, quote unquote, was crushed by a rifle, but his brains splattered. Everyone around him, quote unquote. Moscow Carter, the oldest son, later stated that he scraped up a half a bushel basket of brains around those front steps that had been crushed out of men's heads. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Porter Olson, 36 Illinois, shot in the chest at close Ooh. range. They ripped the shutter off the house, carried him a little ways. His last words were, Dear God, please help me, and died on the spot. A federal drummer boy, 15 years old, I, we believe from Illinois, killed in the middle of the road, trampled over. Next day, he's still laying in that road looking to heaven because that's where his little spirit had flown. Alabama color bear bandit to death on the northwest corner of the home. A fifth Confederate Irish soldier out of Memphis, W.W. Exum, bandit at five times in the middle of the road. That's just a few examples. Went from 150 yards north of us, both sides of the road, Emerson up Dykes Brigade, just behind that slope. They quote unquote, they burst out of the ground like demons. And both sides met on the run like waves crashing together. Now it's like medieval times with gunpowder involved. They're clubbing, clawing, bayoneting, strangling, gouging, shooting, and biting each other. And riding up in a counterattack, Major Lieutenant Colonel Arthur MacArthur, 24th Wisconsin. Anyone here from Wisconsin? Shot in his shoulder, knocked off his horse, rose to his feet out of Confederate Major in the middle of the road. Many believe it's Major Meek from Arkansas. It's not proven, not proven, but many believe that some, whatever. But the two officers sought out each other, and as they near each other, made, uh, the major, Confederate major, shoots McGarth in the chest with a second wound. He falls again. He considered the man was dead, MacArthur. He wasn't, and he's looking to the south now, waving him in through the breakthrough, and as he's looking away, MacArthur rises to his feet, runs a Confederate major completely through with the sword, falls to his knees, dying, but the Confederate major, with a party shot, shoots MacArthur in his right kneecap. Both men are considered mortally wounded. Unfortunately, Confederate Major died. Fortunately, they brought MacArthur into the house on to Nashville, lived to be the father of the famous general of World War II fame, General what? <laughs> History could have been changed by about, what, that much? Douglas MacArthur was a commander of U.S. forces in the Pacific, and his father uh, was that person in the story. So the push and pull of the Battle of Franklin, I mean, this is a frontal assault by the Confederates, and the Union, of course, dug in on their positions. Uh, are just going to rake murderous fire into the Confederates. This is the cotton gin uh, of the Carter farm. Uh, its foundation is right there behind the cannon. Uh, the Confederates, of course, are going to come on in several different waves. The fighting is going to last from 4 p.m. until about 9 p.m. that night. Some of the Union regiments are armed with Henry repeating rifles, so they're not the Springfield uh, rifles or muskets that we've seen before. Right along this view, that's where Patrick Claiborne would have been killed, uh, right in front of the cotton gin. Uh, and that's a private residence on the other side of the battlefield there. So uh, the battlefield itself was reclaimed uh, in the 1990s. Um, in fact, um, many of the sites on the battlefield were fast food locations. Um, so as you go to the Franklin Battlefield, you're, you're walking through what essentially is a park and you kind of have to use your imagination to uh, picture what it was like there in November of 1864. Here we are back at the Carter House. Some existing Union lines right there. Um, as I said, many of the sites on the battlefield were actually... Uh, <laughs> fast food parking lots. Uh, there was a, uh, a pizza hut on the Franklin battlefield as well as some other private residences. Um, the Carter House is working on this garden right here as well as uh, some fields, uh, kind of giving you a, a, an idea of what it may have looked like. Um, the Carter House is on a natural rise, so there's a slight hill there as it straddles the Columbia Turnpike. Uh, and that natural rise uh, was probably one of the reasons why the Union, Union chose to defend Franklin there. So I'm facing off to the west, and just behind that tree line, there's the uh, Franklin Museum. Uh, it's a small little museum, but they have quite a few interesting and important artifacts from the battle. So the Carter House is just beyond that tree line. Uh, the museum is just right there. Um, 
And what are, where I'm off to now is to find the location of my great-great-grandfather's regiment, the 107th Illinois. So this would have been the cotton gin, and you can see there on Google Earth how they were uh, taking out all the modern structures. Of course, there are a lot of modern structures still on the battlefield. Uh, the Carter House is right here. There's the garden. Uh, the museum's parking lot, at least, is right there. The museum's on the other side of the trees. And then the location of the 107th Illinois uh, is a place called Stahl Park, which is today a playground. Uh, so after going to the battlefield in the more, or after going to the battlefield in the evening, uh, I came back uh, the next morning about 7:30. It was hotter than heck there. It was about 100 degrees uh, while I was walking around all these battlefields. Um, but this would have been where the 107th made their stand. Uh, the apartment complex obviously was not there. The Springfield rifles have a range of about 300 to 400 yards, uh, so they would have had a pretty big field of fire uh, in which to meet the Confederate attack. And so it's hard to use your imagination, but if you've read the sources, the official reports uh, from Moore, uh, as well as the commander of the 107th, you get an idea of what it was like. From Moore's report, the enemy made repeated charges at short intervals with fresh troops until late at night, nearly every time reaching the works at some point in my line. The many hand-to-hand -hand encounters are a testament to the many bayonet, bayonet wounds received by my command. The enemy succeeded in planting his colors twice upon the works of the 23rd Michigan and the colors of the 107th Illinois Infantry were seized by a rebel who was killed in attempting to carry them away. The colors were recovered by a private of the regiment named Bailey Walker, a member of Company G, who went over the works and brought them back. The very desperate fighting here at the 107th position. Uh, during one of these charges, the heroic Lieutenant Colonel Lowry of the 107th fell while gallantly cheering his men on to victory. And uh, Captain McGraw there took over command of the 107th with the wounding, the mortal wounding of their Lieutenant Colonel. The fighting will go on here until 9 o'clock. The last Confederate assault was led with torches. Now, in front of the 107th position today is a rather modern townhouse and apartment complex. Uh, but in 1864, there would have been a grove of locust trees right in front of the 107th position, affording the advancing Confederates some opportunity to advance with, with some cover. Um, one of the last Confederate units to make their assault was led by a, uh, a young 24-year-old officer named Todd Carter. It was his house, um, the Carter house, where he had grown up. So here he is, three years away from home, leading a charge in his backyard. Uh, during this fight, Todd Carter allegedly said, follow me, boys, we're going home. And about that moment, a Union musket ball hit him in the head, mortally wounding him. Uh, right in front of the 107th Illinois. Uh, Carter's family found him the following e that evening and they brought him to his house. Uh, and there later on the next morning, he will die in the same house where he was born 24 years earlier. Um, this is Todd Carter's bookshelf that's there in the Franklin Museum. Uh, he learned, he knew Greek and Latin. Uh, he had studied law and was a practicing lawyer before the Civil War. Uh, he's 24 years old uh, when he dies right in his backyard uh, during, the, during the Civil War. Uh, 24 doesn't sound very old to me, might sound old to you, um, but somebody who had a lot of promise in their life and whose life was snuffed out um, by the Civil War. So the 107th position, uh, several wounded men, a dead lieutenant colonel, uh, later on, following the battle and the Union victory of sorts, uh, the Union retreat. Uh, making a clean getaway to Nashville. Now, there are over 8,578 casualties on the battlefield, dead and wounded. Uh, this is the Carrington Plantation, uh, which was owned by the McGavick family. Uh, they're going to open their home uh, to the Confederates as a field hospital. And it was here, more than likely, uh, that Lieutenant Colonel Francis Lowry of the 107th was treated uh, and then died of his wounds. Um, a massive number of Confederate dead uh, in the McGavick Cemetery, uh, organized um, by state. Many of the bodies were unidentifiable. 
Um, and you go to this uh, cemetery there and you can just see the vastness uh, of how many people are, are, are interred there. Uh, we've got the plantation in the background and then obviously the graves of various Confederate soldiers. Well, here in Monticello, and just outside of town here in the cemetery, we have the tomb of Francis Lowry. He was 27 years old. Uh, he was married with a uh, wife and child, a, a baby daughter um, of, Lieutenant, of, of Lieutenant Colonel Lowry. Uh, Moore said that by his strenuous efforts, he contributed largely to the success of the day. His loss is deeply felt by all who knew him, particularly in his own command, where he was best known. Um, you know, when we think about Memorial Day or Veterans Day and we say that these guys, you know, uh, died for our freedoms and whatnot, I, I, I tend to look at Lowry in a very tangible sense. Uh, Lowry had commanded my great-great-grandfather's regiment throughout the entire Civil War for a period of about two and a half years. Uh, and he'd kept them fairly well safe. And through his motivations, they were able to carry the day there at Franklin. So I kind of think I owe a little bit of my existence to him as well probably go out there and uh, pay my respects to him this Memorial Day. Well, uh, emotions and sentimentality behind, of course, I'm an analysis historian, uh, couldn't pass up an opportunity to stand on the railroad tracks where my great-grandfather had traveled to, great-great-grandfather traveled to Columbia, Tennessee to begin the campaign. Uh, right across the Harpeth River here, we have Fort Granger. Uh, this was a Union fort uh, that was built uh, back in 1863. Nathan Bedford Forrest had failed to capture the fort two times. Uh, there on top of some uh, pretty rugged Tennessee terrain, um, you get the idea that the fort uh, was practically impenetrable. Um, the fort itself uh, is overgrown. There are some of the ramparts and trench work uh, that are still there. Um, and there's a little path that kind of goes around so all kinds of visitors can, can view it. And of course, me being me, uh, I had to get off the beaten path and I headed on down a trail uh, towards the bottom of the fort and walked around a little bit there. Didn't see any artifacts or find anything like that. But um, you do kind of get a, a, an interesting sense whenever you visit a battlefield. To me, uh, it's similar to going and seeing live music. It's similar to going and seeing a, 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 a sporting event. Um, you're seeing this stuff with your own eyes and in, in, in your mind, uh, then you can kind of, I think, process it maybe uh, a little better or perhaps understand it a little better. Uh, and so here I'm making my way over the top of the parapet uh, into the fort right here. Uh, they've done a great job preserving the fort. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of history uh, related to this fort that isn't necessarily related to the Battle of Franklin. Uh, but as we look over there on Winstead Hill... Uh, with the Harpeth River in the foreground, could the Confederates have ever captured Franklin? When we think about this fort, when we think about the dug-in Union Army, uh, where that horrific battle's taking place just in those trees. Well, at a more personal level, this is Daniel Carlin in old age, surrounded by uh, his numerous children and, great, uh, and grandchildren. And uh, when I think about you know his experience during the Civil War, uh, it, it kind of helps me... Uh, make this all a little bit more tangible and uh, kind of an interesting thing to research.